good at it. But one thing that came up recently, and it, it seems to happen whenever there is a Democrat, especially in the White House, uh, but it's been a long issue where there's a terrible, tragic shooting. Um, and then you'll hear beautiful words and then calls for gun control. So what happened recently and what is it with this latest push by President Biden in particular for more gun control? Sometimes he says things that are just mind boggling. That's not news to you or to the people listening uh, to us now. So you're talking about the uh, killing of six people and the wounding of 12 and the firing of 70 rounds in 54 seconds and in the entertainment district Saturday night in Sacramento, California. The president came out in favor of gun laws that already exist. They already exist in California and they exist at the federal level. So his statement presumes that a human being cold and malicious enough to slaughter six innocent strangers is intelligent and prudent enough to respect gun laws. Well, this is absurd. Uh, a monster like that doesn't respect any law. He only respects the violence that he's using. The answer that the government, that the president dare not speak is to allow people to carry guns. Somebody would have blown him away before he killed number two, three, four, five, uh, or six. But they don't want to hear that because they believe absurdly, and this is not a criticism of the police at all, the police can't be everywhere at all times, that the police can protect us. The police arrive after these crimes occur. They protect them from going further. They, they, they arrest the perpetrator, theoretically the right person. They build a, a case against that person and, and then the courts take over. But in terms of protecting us on the spot, we have to protect ourselves. And when the government has taken away our right to bear arms, not to keep. Supreme Court took care of that in 2008. We can own arms, carry them in our homes and on our property, but that's not the great place of danger. The great place of danger is outside. Alabama, you can carry. Where I live in New Jersey, even as an ex-judge, I can't carry. As a judge, I, I could sign my own carry mit, permit, but as soon I was, as I was no longer a judge, that permit uh, would have expired because the government uh, employs the myth that it can protect us. Well, in Joe Alabama- doesn't see it. Joe doesn't see it that way for him to say, you know, shoot the feet. That's just absurd. That has nothing to do with the presidency. He's probably never had a gun in his hands. Well, I think there was that also famous line of, you know, buy a shotgun, buy a shotgun, just pop off two rounds of a shotgun. That'll scare somebody off. It might scare certain people off, but that's not the proper use of a, of a firearm. That's a, a consistent thing you hear often with gun control advocates. They don't even understand that which they're looking to regulate. And it's interesting, the, where you're sitting, you already brought this up, but where you're sitting in New Jersey, somewhere undisclosed, and where I'm sitting here in Montgomery, Alabama, we don't give out the exact address to just anybody uh, here either from all the stuff we say. But we just passed constitutional carry, as it's called here in Alabama, or permitless carry. So you no longer have to pay for a permit to a sheriff in order to be able to carry concealed uh, in your vehicle or on your person. And I'd imagine it's not the same way in New Jersey. And I've even heard horror stories, correct me if I'm wrong, that you know, here in Alabama, it's pretty standard doctrine that if somebody enters your home, you can fire off at them, you can shoot them. It's the castle doctrine, I believe. What is the difference in the different states and where maybe does this go with the Supreme Court in the coming years? Well, as we speak, and, and by the way, I, I applaud uh, the voters of uh, Alabama. I mean, there are two beauties of constitutional carry. One is you don't have to pay for it. The other is you don't have to tell the government that you have the gun. That's very, very important, this non-registration, because throughout history, the first thing tyrants in the modern era, the first thing tyrants have done is let's, let's find out who has the guns and take them away. Government has no business knowing who has a gun, just like the government has no business knowing who has a printer or a microphone or, or a podcast. Your, your freedom to think as you wish, say what you think, publish what you say is as integral to your humanity as your, uh, as your right to self-defense. Now, as for the Supreme Court, 
In 2008, the late great Justice Antonin Scalia authored a case called District of Columbia versus Heller, articulating that the right to keep and bear arms is a personal right, not a collective right. It belongs to all individuals. And so the District of Columbia and eventually the states cannot interfere with your right to purchase and own a gun and keep it on your private property. Now, as we speak, Joey, before the court is the issue of carry. Hmm. It's not New Jersey's law, it's New York's law, which is the same as New Jersey's, that the bureaucrats have the right to decide whether or not you can carry, depending upon how dangerous they think your life is and how likely you are to be attacked uh, by the bad guys. Chief Justice John Roberts in the oral argument on the case crystallized everything by saying, well, what kind of a fundamental right is this if it's subject to the whims of a bureaucrat? So I honestly think that the right to carry will soon be universal, that Alabama uh, and states like it have actually paved the way. I won't tell you who, but I reason to believe there's a member of the Supreme Court who carries. Oh, <laughs> very interesting. I hope it's Amy Coney Barrett. No, I, I don't know what it is. About I'll just start naming names. Clarence Thomas, no. Um, but with real quick on the court, uh, especially as you see where it's going, um, how much the, the anniversary came and went, unfortunately, without me commenting on it, but how much of an absence is there when you say you don't have somebody like a Scalia anymore? I know these are new, talented people that have replaced folks, but that man in particular is such an institution. Well, I'm a little biased because one of the great gifts of my life uh, was a, a close personal friendship with him for the last 10 years uh, of his life. That doesn't mean we agreed on everything. Uh, it does mean that we analyzed to death uh, the nature <laughs> over usually tomato sauce. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, the, the nature of human freedom and the role uh, of the courts in our lives. I'm also a little biased because, as you know, President Trump consulted me a number of times on uh, his nominees to the court. Um, my hero there now is not my boyhood friend, Sam Alito. He's my, my good personal friend. Mm. My hero, whom I've never actually met, uh, is Neil Gorsuch. Justice Gorsuch is the only one who has a, a libertarian uh, strain in his body. Justice Gorsuch and I studied legal philosophy under the same person a generation apart. Uh, I know exactly how he feels about these things, and the same as you and me and many people listening to us, that our rights come from our humanity and not from the government. And the government can only take our rights away after due process, meaning a jury trial at which it has to prove fault. It can't just enact legislation taking our rights away, like you can't carry a gun until you meet our standards. It can't issue a decree taking our rights away, like wear a mask on your face and we're closing the churches and we're closing businesses because we don't know what to do uh, about a so-called uh, pandemic. These things can only happen after a jury trial. Justice Gorsuch believes that. Well, and it's a... So I, can, I, I commend uh, Trump for that. The, the other two, you mentioned the name of one, and she and I went to the same law school, again, a generation apart. We had many of the same professors, Justice Barrett and, and Justice uh, Kavanaugh, are more in the traditional conservative Republican vein than they are in the libertarian vein. Well, I just find the, the makeup of the court is fascinating. And when I see, let's say, the prestige media, the oligarchic press uh, freaking out over this court. And it, I mean, it, is it cynical of me to think that they said, and somebody asked me this last night, hey, Justice Breyer, uh, we got a midterm that we're not going to do so hot in. The Republicans are going to take the Congress. How much longer are you going to do this, man? Well, look, uh, you mentioned our dear friend Jeff Deist. Uh, as you know, Jeff has a radio show out of uh, Orlando, Florida, and I was his guest for part of it yesterday. And we discussed the very, very interesting, fascinating phenomenon. Are you ready for this? Libertarians in favor of Judge Katanji Brown Jackson. Hmm. Libertarians. She is a civil libertarian. She is with us 
on civil liberties and privacy and surveillance consistently with us. Not just not with us on other things, right? You know, redistribution of wealth, regulation of the economy, all that kind of thing. But on civil liberties, she's going to vote against the conservatives, with the liberals, with the libertarian, and when they can bring the chief justice with them, we have a majority that says the Fourth Amendment means what it says. <laughs> well, and I would hope they apply that to, I don't know if she would with the Second Amendment, but uh, just in closing here, I, I'm thinking of Senator John Kennedy's questioning of, of Judge Jackson and where he's talking about the Ninth Amendment. And when I read the Ninth Amendment as an amateur, just American, you know, red-blooded American, I see a lot of personal rights, like the Supreme Court found with the Second Amendment being a personal right. Seems like somebody like a Senator Kennedy, though he's probably just making an argument and playing devil's advocate, it says, no, the Ninth Amendment means these collective rights we have to decide through the legislative process. And it ends he's up being absolutely wrong. He's absolutely wrong. The Ninth Amendment links the Constitution to natural law. The Ninth Amendment says that our rights come from our humanity and the government shall not disparage them. And the origins of the Ninth Amendment is an argument between Alexander Hamilton and James Madison. Madison says we have to list the rights that the government can't interfere with. Hamilton says, let me give you 20 rights that it can't interfere with. Madison says, I'll give you another 20. Hamilton says, I'll give you another 20. Madison realizes he has to come up with language that protects all rights without enumerating them because they're too great to enumerate. He couldn't possibly have foreseen where our rights would come to today. So he wrote this iconic language saying, the fact that we've listed all these rights in amendments one through eight does not mean that there aren't others and all those others shall not be disparaged by the government. Well, I have nothing to do with the legislature or, or with collective rights. I know Senator Kennedy, and I hope he had a tongue in cheek. If he didn't, he, he has to take my course this summer as well. <laughs> I like that guy, he's one of my, my favorites up there, but he does need to take that course if that's where he was really going with it. And uh, on that note, uh, I've got a, a candidate for governor and the former ambassador to, to uh, Slovenia here in the studio. Wow. So, um, I, I want to bid sure she you. has some uh, insight into what's going on in uh, Eastern Europe as we speak. Yes, sir. And uh, always, folks, you can check out Judge Napolitano on YouTube and wherever podcasts are available. Judging Freedom. And you can always go to judgenap.com. And...